Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Genuine Chit Chat. This week, I'm joined by Eddie Lauren, the CEO and founder of Strategic Realty Holdings, LLC. Now, essentially what Eddie does is his company buys apartment buildings with investors, um, improves them, makes it more of a community center and things, uh, and tries to sort of improve a lot of impoverished communities and things while also, you know, using the money to help with more charitable causes, more philanthropic pursuits and things. So it's kind of like a balance of sort of the best case scenario with capitalism, I think. He seems like an individual who genuinely wants to help the world, so I think he's a very inspiring individual to listen to, and also he talks about, you know, investment and realty and that sort of thing, so it's it's interesting to listen to both from a financial and business perspective, but also from a personal perspective. Now, there's not really much else to add on that front without going into ridiculous detail, so I'll kind of let this go on. Um, before the chat gets started, there'll be a quick promo by the We're All Wicked podcast, uh, and then after that, we'll get onto the main chat. After that, I'll be back at the end to talk about upcoming episodes and the usual sort of stuff. You know, you can follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, review on iTunes, share the show, all that sort of stuff. So thanks, as always, for tuning in, guys, and I'll talk to you all at the end. Hello, this is the We're All Wicked podcast, a true crime podcast brought to you by Mr. Wicked. No, we're talking (laughs) we're talking Columbine shooters. Carly Rose. We delve into the darkest crimes so you don't have to. You can find us on iTunes, Spotify, Wooshka.com, and on Twitter at Mr. Wicked WAW and at Dead Rose Bouquet. Come join the insanity. Welcome to Genuine Chit Chat, where we have honest conversations with interesting people. And I'm your host, Mike Burton. I'm joined today by Eddie Lauren, um, and you're a very busy individual um, for, it seems like for your entire life, you've been kind of just doing exactly what instead of thinking of things like, you know, what could I do? How could I do this? You, you just do it. You, you go out there and you've just, you've started a lot of organizations and done a lot with your life. So would you like to just briefly say to people, you know, what, what you do essentially in your own words? Well, we give people a clean, safe, affordable place to live, treat them with respect and dignity so they can stay, pay and refer their friends. We cater to the working class and the affordable residents, the working poor, and try to give them the dignity they we all deserve. That's the bottom line, whether it's through philanthropy or renovating properties or building properties or just my daily life. I try to do the right thing all the time and that's as simple as it can be. That's a very sort of noble way to live your life. I mean, I know it's very easy for um, people who are sort of figureheads of businesses or have very successful companies to lose sight of the individuals and just see people as sort of the the dollar signs, essentially. And it's very nice to see um, in all lines of your work that you always uh, keep people involved. It's always about the people. Um, so regarding um, sort of one of your uh one of your ventures, it's it's a lot about, in very, very layman's terms, I saw it as almost renovating, but it, it's a lot more than that. And I don't know if you want to sort of uh, elaborate a little bit on the, the sort of key things you're doing at the moment. Yeah, we try to take blight and make light, very simply. We're taking a lot of, there's a lot of landlords out there and owners of property that neglect things. It's tired and we try to breathe new life into them with exciting Amenities, we, we say A amenities for B and C residents, meaning that they're not as, you know, A, amenity, A, A apartments are brand new, gorgeous, expensive, and we try to do a value proposition, give everybody the same thing they can get in an A property, but, you know, at half the price or even less. So we're value players and we care a lot about providing value to everyone. Our properties, our investors, our, our residents, our management staff, and our own employees here at uh, Strategic. So, you know, we take a big global approach to every property we buy and renovate and sell, um, and hopefully we can keep them with some restrictions on so the next guy will keep them affordable as well. 
I see. Yeah, that's a good way of thinking ahead and things and, and trying to make sure that you don't essentially go in, sort things out, kind of uh, take a back step, and then someone else comes in just ruins it all. Um, so I, I saw uh, online it's a lot of the things you do are to do with uh, investors and things like that. So um, for people who aren't uh, as familiar with sort of a lot of the uh, terminology and the lingo, is it people essentially you get investors to invest money into these sort of uh, downtrodden properties, properties that could really do a bit of like a, a new coat in a sense. And you go in there and with the money from the investors, you kind of improve the buildings and things. Is, is that a general idea of what you uh, yeah. specifically do? Included in that is the purchase. So we mm-hmm. raise the money to purchase and renovate. So yeah, I see. Absolutely. So, and that's when I assume, obviously, when you do that, then you have a lot more freedom to do with what you want and you can kind of uh, experiment a bit more. Um, may I ask, what are some of the sort of unexpected challenges that came about doing this? How, how long have you been doing this, sorry? And uh, what are some of the challenges, if you don't mind me asking? Sure. I've uh, been doing this 25 years and there's always challenges. You know, the more you live, the more you learn and the less you know. So, <laughs> that's the problem. Uh, you think you become an expert and you're just like, I. You know, I, I thought I'd seen everything and then this happens. You know, investors don't show up at the closing table and you get in trouble. You can lose some money. It's a lot of trust that you trust in the wrong people or you get um, too exposed to one person and they can clobber you. I mean, there's so many things. It's, it's, it's a challenge. You know, you do the best you can every day and try to wake up and smile and and give people value and hope that uh, the powers of the universe work with you and the, the winds behind your back rather than, you know, in front of you all day. <laughs> yeah, I can, I can imagine that is, is very tasking. I mean, you know, sort of one of the things with me is my, my dad, he uh, ran his own business and things. And I always used to think it was, it was incredible the amount of time one has to put in and the amount of thought and you, you have to invest yourself. And, and the thing that a lot of people don't think about is obviously there's the, the huge financial uh, worries and pressures that come along with uh, doing it yourself, sort of being a figurehead of a business or anything like that. But another thing is, as you say, is the people. I mean, all it takes is, you know, trying to do a, um, a startup trusting some of the wrong people or thinking they're trustworthy and then like doing the wrong things at the wrong time. And then it can really make everything crumble away um do you find that you found almost like a a team or a network of at least trustworthy people that you've kind of got or is it uh, quite an everlasting change yeah all the above um my kids hate when i say that you know it depends on the answer but i think that you always have a deep core of individuals you work with but sometimes people change people change you know they have divorce they lose interest or they're not interested in the deal you want to do and you want to do something else. So you go find a different set of people and you risk the opportunity to deal with new people and hope that they're good people. And, um, you know, it's, it's, you got to trust your gut and you got to pray a lot that everybody's got the same, you know, paddling in the same direction. And, but yes, primarily I've, I've collected a, a lot of good people in my life and my career and try to, keep doing business with those good people rather than some of the people that have been not so good. (laughs) Yeah. And it's a, it's that sort of trust and loyalty that can really help build an enterprise in a lot of ways. And um, how did you sort of uh, get started in this? Cause you said you've been doing it obviously for 25 years and that's obviously quite a while. I mean, is there something specific that got you on this track or has it been quite a few things that kind of slowly led you up to this point? Yeah. Um, I always wanted to be in real estate. I tried food and clothing and it wasn't for me. So I went to shelter and I was in the commercial real estate game and it wasn't um, bad, but it wasn't for me. And I found that my niche was giving people value and you can affect a lot of things where people live. So I gravitated toward after all the food groups of real estate and industrial retail, I honed in on residential and I've become pretty good at, like I said, giving a amenities to B and C residents and focusing on value. And uh, so it just evolved and I've been doing the same thing over and over again because you do what feels good, what you like and what's fun or you can't get up every day and deal with it. <laughs> That's the ball. Exactly, yeah. And one of the things that I noticed about um, when you're, you've got the foundation, the Happy Foundation, um, it, that 
is that more along the lines of the sort of charitable and philanthropic sort of uh, mentality, less so than the business sort of sense, or, or is it still quite a mix? I like to say that, you know, profit with a purpose is good business, but yes, it's more philanthropic oriented and it's more focused on taking where people live, you know, instead of the YMCA or the synagogue or the church, people are hardworking. They don't have time to go have another stop, another thing to do in their lives. So we try to do creative and fun health oriented things in the clubhouse where people live right at their doorstep. Mm. So it's really just a way to bring programming and community gardens and all kinds of unique and interesting sense things that can be build community through health right on people where they live. So well, go ahead. That's perfect. Yeah. I mean, what I've said a lot is, I mean, my own religious beliefs is um, I'm sort of an atheist. I've kind of flit around with different things like that. But, you know, one thing that I find, I haven't got anything against religion in any way, but there's one thing with the religion I find that really people kind of still need, even if they are more atheist, more secular, is that community element. And that's the thing that a lot of people can really benefit from is just the, the things that a lot of the issues people are having uh, with mental health, um, with a lot of the other tragedies that's been going on, not only in uh, sort of America, but in England and all sorts of other places is if people have that sense of community and that sense of purpose, then when one gets into sort of a darker place, you have other people to build you up. And if you're trying to start that, or well, you are doing that in, in many locations around where people live and you're, you're building these things up for these people, then it must be not only so gratifying, but also to see some of these communities flourish and things. It, it must be fantastic to be able to be a part of that. It is. That's what makes me get up every day, to see how you can make communities thrive just by creating the environment with which people can feel comfortable and safe and respected. Mm, exactly. And what else sort of motivates you? Do you have sort of a um, a regime or do you have a, a journal or do you meditate? Or is there any sort of thing that you kind of really helps you hone in on like, getting you up in the morning in a sense? Well, I try to do something physical every day. That's really important, whether it's Pilates or going to a fitness trainer or doing yoga or getting on an elliptical or just taking a walk with the dog, clear my head. That's really important. Um, and I just think that I'm not done yet in my life making my mark. And so that's what motivates me. I want our legacy where everybody can look and say, you know what, he really did change the world one apartment at a time. And that's what you want to do is, is that sort of if you had like a 10, 20, 30 year plan is just slowly building your name and other uh, companies and things and just trying to improve the living situations from individuals who can't uh, because the system may not allow for them to kind of build these things themselves and they maybe need a helping hand. Yeah. And I just want to make sure that I collect good people along the way and have a good life and enjoy every day. That, that's a that's a fantastic way to sort of live in things. And um, I hope you don't mind me uh, asking this, but um, when you were sort of a bit younger, there was quite a few, uh, one would call them setbacks, others would say potentially uh, tragedies um, that affected your life. I don't know if you'd be willing to speak about um, those things in a little bit. Sure. I was um, 10 months when my father died and my mother worked really hard, had no money to raise four boys alone. And she died at 17. So I was orphaned before I went to UCLA and left in the world to fend for myself. Even though I had my brothers, they were married. They had their own lives as they should. And so I went through a deep uh, searching and very difficult time. And that's when I came out of that, emerged with a sense of wanting to prove to the world that I was worthy because, uh, you know, growing up with those setbacks, you feel like you're not worthy or you're, you're cursed or the world's against you. And so trying to work out that gratitude, that thankfulness, that sense of just being comfortable in your own skin is a hard thing to come to. But I think it's helped me in the long run because self-discovery is probably the most important thing. We can all run at a father-in-law who used to say, you know, the old cars, when you'd see silent movies and the cars were all just going around crazy and it, it was like the choke. I guess there was a choke in the 1920s when you, so you left the choke out and that's how you 
were able to move your car. It wasn't really a gas pedal. So my father-in-law always said, you know, a lot of people in this world are running with their choke out. And I always thought of that and said, you know, I don't want to do that. I want to be thoughtful and deliberate and cautious, but yet enjoy my life and do things in a stable way. And I don't want to be running around with my choke out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that's, that's a great way to look at it. I mean, with uh, my own experience personally, uh, some people who listen to this show, uh, if they're regular listeners will already know that I lost my dad uh, when I was 19. Um, I'm fortunate enough that my mother's still about, but when my father died, it was one of those moments where I was like, it's the worst thing that's ever happened to me but it was one of the best things that's ever happened to my character and my work ethic. You know, once that sort of happens, you, one thing that a lot of people who haven't uh, lost a close love or may not understand in the same way is you see a lot of sort of when really bad things happen, you know, you kind of often see them happen to other people and you're seeing these things and you're kind of like, there's that weird part of your mind that's like, that will never happen to me or mm-hmm. that, that won't happen. And then it does. And you can't escape it because everyone goes through some amount of horrendousness in their life. And when it hits you, it, everyone processes it in a different way. And for me, it wasn't like a, it wasn't like being hit by a train because my father uh, died of cancer. So it was a, sort of a slower thing. But when it actually happened, it didn't really hit me for a few months to afterwards. And I was kind of looking inward and I, and I noticed about myself that it was a very pivotal point in my in my development because I was like, you know, that could be me at any point. Why am I just not kind of going for it and doing it and just getting out there and sorting things out? You know, if I want to do things a certain way or I want to, you know, get things done, I want to do that. But at the same time, not trying to, you know, climbing up the ladder doesn't mean one has to push other people down. And that's one thing that I think a lot of people miss out on. They, they seem to get this uh, very conservative sort of starvation mentality where it's like there's not enough for everyone and therefore i need it you know yeah (laughs) (laughs) yeah uh, you know that's the sort of things that i I think with a lot of people there's i've spoken to a couple of other sort of ceos and people who are very successful in their lives and it's not uncommon for for lack of a better word better word tragedy to push them and uh, make them do these great things and so it's it's nice to hear that you've made light of such a negative situation. And now that you're pushing through and you're, you're sort of, you're trying to improve these uh, neighborhoods and these environments, for these people. So if certain things that are negative have happened to them, then they can really push forward and they don't have as many setbacks in that sort of way as well. Well, you hope that you change someone's environment, you can change their life, but you know, you can take a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. All we can do is the best we can. It is very frustrating and, it's often disappointing when you see people go off the rails, even though they've had all the opportunities they can. But like you said, they may be mentally ill or they may be defeated. And that's why we need a social safety net, because not everybody in a capitalist society can be a winner. That's just the nature of the game. So to the extent people are not able to be winners, they need to be handled and cared for. That's why we take vouchers. We try to give people that um, same dignity that they would have if they had taken a different turn or had a different luck or a different uh, parent who had money. So you oftentimes feel see that the, the, the most righteous, I made it myself, you know, those people are the ones you got to you know, worry about because they're not really looking at the fact that this society, the way that we have in, in the UK and America, the opportunities are here that aren't anywhere else. And yes, you can either be lazy and not proceed and not win, but you could also um, get lucky. And you can't just take the luck as you're better than anyone else. So you just got to keep it all in perspective. I guess I keep saying the older you get, the more you realize, the less you know. Um, I was going to say that there's an analogy of just like looking through the keyhole and when you're younger looking through the door and you kind of just tall enough to see through it and you think you know everything that's in the room and then you get older and older and older and, and then you finally open the door and then you realize everything you thought you knew it's nothing in comparison to that view of that little keyhole and that's you're right. in you open the room and it's 
it's incredible. I mean, I, I find that every almost every venture I go into, and the older I get, it is as you said, the less you know. You lo- find out a little nugget of information about something, and then suddenly it's like, oh, that was from a mountain, <laughs> and I know nothing about that at all. Well, you you got to make sure that you're using a lot of humility, and hopefully that's what it gives you, because. More part of negotiation and business is really understanding and putting yourself in the other person's shoes. So there's a win-win relationship and a win-win deal. Otherwise, it can't be one-sided. Eventually, the resentment comes and it just doesn't work out. So that's part of the issues we have in this country right now, at least with the president we do. He's not into win-win. He's into I win, you lose. And that is not a comfortable way for me to live nor a lot of people here. I agree. I mean, what out of interest, what is your uh, general sort of, I'm not necessarily your political stance being uh, sort of left or right, but in general, what sort of things about, especially the Western world, taking uh, the United States as the prime example, are there certain things that you would really want to change and things that really you think that almost if not necessarily if you're in charge, but things that you can't see why they aren't done a certain way. I mean, obviously the housing is one large part of it. Well, I think everybody would, it would be great if everybody just came back to the middle. You know, the right is going farther to the right and the left is going farther to the left. And the people who are losing are the middle class that doesn't exist anymore. And so you're either a have or a have not. And that's what frustrates me because, again, in a capitalist society, there are winners and losers. If we win, we're lucky to, enough to be in a position, however we got there, whether it's the golden sperm scenario or you earned it yourself or you got lucky. But that means that there are plenty who didn't have that opportunity to win. And that should they be on the streets? Punished? No. I think that the tolerance of the system needs to be more adult than childlike, which is what it seems to be now. And that understanding can make everybody have that safety net. And so, yes, I'm, I'm more left than right, but I'm really in the center. And then my common, my, my party's the common sense party. And I just don't think it exists anymore. No, I completely agree. And uh, over here we're having in England and we're having very similar issues and things with that sort you know the people who you know there's people on the far right and then they push back and then people go more left as you say and then people getting further and further from the center and it's like you need both perspectives to really understand everything yeah it's called respect (laughs) that doesn't seem to exist anymore no people just shout at each other yeah i mean the other if we think about how this how my decision affects the other is so important then we can all come closer to the center and i think we all are basically we're used to be in the middle they're just i just don't know why we've lost our way and have to fight over things so it's very disconcerting to me and i think that again the ones who lose are the hardest working of us all Mm, i completely agree and one issue um sort of in america that i'm aware of obviously being from the uk we get quite privileged with uh, the nhs which is the national health service you know free health care for essentially anyone and although there are obviously many flaws in that sort of system people over here can if they have more uh, money behind them they can go to private health care which is uh, more top quality in things but but one thing about america i mean it, it's a great land no doubt but one of the big flaws i found was when people give birth it costs tens of thousands of dollars and over here it doesn't at all it, it, and it, that really that was one thing where like people who are born with conditions i have friends who are just born with crohn's disease or just things that are wrong with them they need constant medication for and over here you're not necessarily punished for that in the same way and it is it is quite baffling to me of just people who are born with all the wrong cards you know a poor family and then these health conditions and all these other things and then they come into this society and then everything all this weight is already on them before they even get going and that's that's not fair yes life is not fair and we can make it more fair than not if we'd all just band together but the kind of people who want to help the world don't seem to be in favor unfortunately I mean, I don't think Obama was a bad president. He had compassion. He told the truth. And whether you like his policies or not, he at least had dignity and respect for the working man. 
that's gone now. And that's the saddest part. And I try to do my part to make sure that everyone, at least who lives and dwells under my roof, roofs, <laughs> gets that respect and dignity. And that's all I can do. So like I said, I'm just trying to change the, the world of one apartment at a time. I'm not interested in politics. I don't want to do that. I just, but I know that if we all just picked up the paper in front of us, the world would be a better place, but it doesn't seem to be everyone else's priority. Well, no, it's, it's, that is the, that's one of the big issues. And um, to, to go into just some sort of the, uh, more of the business oriented side of things um, with your, well, with the businesses that you're sort of a part of, what are the, not, I'd say that the driving, the driving forces are obviously you want to sort of improve things uh, for these individuals. But from a business perspective, uh, is it the investments and things that is the real thing that kind of catches the people that maybe don't have such a philanthropic side, but still want to benefit and help? Is it sort of, is it more the, the investing sort of thing that gets the money up or what's the sort of uh, the business model in a sense? Well, nothing happens unless money is spent. That's the that's the challenge. So you have to give people a return. Just try to convince them that you're not only giving them a return, but it's profit with a purpose. And hopefully more and more people want to do the right thing with their investment dollars rather than just buy to make as much money as they can. You can do both. And that's what the definition of impact investing is. And I'm trying to be a crusader across the country for affordable housing as the ultimate impact investment. Short of feeding the hungry, clothing the hungry, shelter, the basic needs. That's impact. And if you can make a profit by having a return from rents and from appreciation, all the better. Exactly. And um, I've heard this argument before um, from uh, people who are far more intelligent than I am of there are a lot of charities which exist um, and you know ones that solely rely on donations. And the issue of that is obviously – as austerity grows and you know the poor essentially get poorer and the rich get richer and then the the richer and richer want to cling on to their money more and then the poorer can't afford to be as giving you get this sort of thing where charities are suffering and as, as well as all the overheads they have you know there's as many uh, charities you can see online where the amount of money they actually spend on charitable things due to the amount of overheads is it's incomparable whereas having the business model which is philanthropic as well it means that you can still thrive in the capitalist society you can still have people really aspiring to reach great things and still you know going up the chain and you know investing money in all these things but it means that you a lot of the profits not only go towards helping people further one's own individual finances but also the communities and things and i just think that's fantastic and it's it's actually quite a shame there's not more people like you. Well, it is. And, you know, as I try to crusade to all the foundations and wealthy people, they don't seem to care as much as I wish they would. And they feel like it's, they don't want to give, pay taxes, but they want the government to take care of all the problems. And the government's running out of dough, so we have to get the foundations and all of us have to pitch in to make a difference and not just have the government do it. And we can't just look at things uh, purely for profit. The problem is a lot of these um, so-called impact investors right now are really more in interested in, in solar in Botswana. And I'm not disputing that anything ar in the, around the world or gender equality, I mean, there's all kinds of issues, but to me, the basic need of housing in a clean, safe place should be the ultimate priority other than of course, food and, and clothing. And so uh, people are at least in the impact world and it's growing, but it's not as sexy to go house the poor. And that's a shame. Mm. Yeah, I, I agree. And um, in still staying in line with sort of housing the poor, what do you think has caused a lot of the sort of the issues um, with, in, especially more in recent years, which is making housing um over here in the UK, it's it's a similar situation, but more so obviously in America, uh, where you're a lot more sort of literate with the finances and the housing over there. What are the reasons you think that the housing has become so unaffordable and why people such as yourselves ha kind of have to get in there and sort this out? Well, number one, supply and demand is always an issue. When things get too expensive, there's not enough of it. 
So like in California, it's there, anybody can argue next door. If you want to, one person can say, I don't want you to build those 50 units to me because it'll bring in that bad element or it'll bring in too much traffic. Well, sorry, we're too lenient here. I'm going to sound like I'm on the right. People have too many rights. We have to build and buy and do as much housing as possible before we are just in dire straits. The other side of it, besides build more, is incomes need to go up. And there's a huge disparity between the 1%, the ultra wealthy, and the rest of society. So if rents go up by almost 100% in the last 10 years, and incomes have gone up 20%, gee, that's pretty obvious recipe for disaster, isn't it? Exactly. So it's all common sense, but nobody's willing to do anything about it. And that is the problem. Uh, obviously, that's one of the unfortunate symptoms of a capitalist society. I mean, I do say that, um, I've heard someone else say this, I think it's uh, capitalist society is the, essentially the best way that we can go for things because every other sort of method of doing things is so bad that it just doesn't work at True. all. And every system has flaws. And if we can... Yeah use and utilize yeah money being a fun a big driver for people and there are going to be some people who try and take advantage of the system but you can really use that model to help a lot of people and um, you said about people uh, and their rights what sort of things would you want to uh, sort of implement more and, and push if you there weren't as many uh, regulations and set and such i just think that civility a lot of them are personal responsibility um like here in Los Angeles, we have so much tolerance for people to lay around the streets. I don't know why they should have the right to lay in the street. It's ridiculous. It's a public hazard, public health. So we need some more guts from these politicians willing to stand up and say, this is just the way it's going to be. But everybody second guesses everybody. And it's just big one big circle jerk, I think. <laughs> that is true, yeah. One, you know, someone tries to sort of uh, give an inch, and then the other side says they're taking a mile. And then after all this arguing and debating, we get it over here all the time. And it's just, it's only a tiny thing. And there's so much bickering and so much ego in the way of just people not being able to actually come to a negotiation and a compromise. It ends up just splitting and everyone sort of goes their own way, nothing gets done. And then all the people who are invulnerable get hurt. Yeah. Stagnation is the worst problem. But all these people that fight, like you say, they just end up doing nothing. And they don't want to lose their job. And they don't want to do this and offend. And they don't want to be ridiculed. And, you know, and people have to just stand up and do the right thing. It's always the best thing to go, isn't it? The right thing. And people should have this moral their are morals of just you know what is right well right is not allowing your fellow man to you know starve or die while there's people living in essentially castles you know i'm not saying we should live in a completely socialist society and everyone should be equal because that's a ridiculous fallacy that would never work but there right. does have to be a middle ground yes but it doesn't seem to exist anymore. and both sides are to blame and that's that i don't know what the answer is because everybody needs to grow up I completely 100% agree. And um, in line with your, a lot of your sort of entrepreneurship and all the things you've been doing, what, are there any sort of, um, it sounds so, so lame to say out loud almost, but like tips or anything that you really think really, some things that you would have liked to have known when you were younger um, for to help with entrepreneurship? Like you just said, trust your gut. I think there's one word, acceptance. I wish I could accept that life's not fair. I hadn't done that. It's taken me years to accept it. And I think that's really the most important advice. In fact, that's what I read every day. Accept the things you cannot change because it's so easy to say life's not fair and I'm cursed and I've had a shitty existence or whatever. You know, that's, I wish I'd have learned that when I was 20. Hmm. Yeah, a lot of people do have a sort of, idealistic viewpoint on things and then sort of one thing goes wrong and they think the entire world is against them when it's like the world's against everybody <laughs> we're, we're all you know it's it's such a weird thing i've been thinking about and we gotta be thankful yep exactly you just have to have gratitude for what you do have and the, hopefully you're surrounded by good people and good and good 
times and just not get too caught up in the future and just accept life for what it is. I find life is a lot about the moments. Like there's a lot of grind and there's a lot of times where you're just doing a lot of work. But when you get those moments of completion, I find, especially when you have a project, I mean, like with yourself, when you spent, it must be years and years like uh, sorting out and sort of uh, uplifting, upscaling all these buildings and helping these sort of communities. I mean, that must take years to do. Yeah, yeah, it does. And then when at the end of it, you must see it and be like, feel such a sense yeah. of pride. It's wonderful. And to see the people enjoying a fitness center that never had one and, um, you know, a community center with a lot of people hanging out and a community garden with little kids showing you their incredible um, corn they just built or, or grew. It's awesome. <laughs> so you had, it's there are farming and gardening areas as well that you uh, help build into these yeah. communities. Community gardens, yeah. That's beautiful. What's, have you been doing that for a long time? Because I'm not sure I've heard many uh, places do that. Yeah. Four or, five, four or five years um, we do the best we can but you need buy-in you need people the residents to take some responsibility and grow and if I've, we've built it and they have not come in the past so that's a challenge too so hopefully you get enough people that want to make their stake in the ground literally and you give them the opportunity and they can kind of bond through we had one marriage out of uh, our community garden a couple of years ago in texas the two, two people met and they didn't even know each other and they gardened together and they ended up getting married. I mean, things happen. That's beautiful. That is absolutely fantastic. And um, may I ask with um, just sort of a, a general overview of like um, the cycle in a sense. So talk me through what happens when you see um, you see an area and you want to sort of, you look at say an apartment building and you think, I want to sort that out. I want to change that. What do you do in general from that point to get to the, the end game? Obviously I don't need like hours and hours of detail because I'm sure there's years and years to go into it, but at general sort of stages, what are the things that you kind of end up doing? Um, when we finally get the property and close, you mean? Yes, yeah. Yeah, we start with the sign. We want someone to go buy the sign and say, I only wish I could afford to live there. That looks really cool. And then paint job so it's attractive and it feels fresh and it feels clean. And then when you go into the clubhouse, you actually see a state-of-the-art fitness center, resort-style pool, and you see an environment that says, I want to live here. And when you walk in and you realize you can't afford the rents because, you know, it's a nice place and then it smells good. It feels good. And when you go into the apportioned unit that you're going to look at and see how we've renovated it and say, hey, you know, nice cabinets, nice flooring. This feels good. And that's just the basic dignity respect that we want to deliver to every one of our residents. And that's that's all anyone should really need in their, their homes, isn't it? Just not having to worry about all these things and, and when people move into these uh places i'm not as familiar with the uh housing market in america um basically at all do people generally do they own the property or do they li do they rent it no. rent. i see okay that makes sense yeah living in sort of uh, rented accommodation where like I, i've lived in a couple of different places and i've had a, a few degrees of landlord and it's always the ones where you know you just give them a text or whatever and then just say oh by the way this is leaking a little bit and the one i've got at the moment is fantastic and he just comes over just sorts it out straight away and it's just it, it makes you feel so homely well rather than i've had especially friends who've had places where it sounds nice and it's all a bit flashy and then you get there and it starts to sort of fall apart a little bit yeah well we're we buy two, 300 unit communities. So we have an on-site manager, two maintenance guys, an assistant. And so there's always someone there in case you need something. Yeah. So it's kind of different than the way you're talking. If you have, you rent one place and you know, that's not what we do. I mean, of course it exists in America, but that's not what we do. We focus on apartment communities and create communities mm. through health. And the the clubhouse you mentioned, is that usually um, sort of like a central communal area you uh, tend to have in each of these communities? Yes, and it also carries the main office. And there's usually a kitchen and people can rent it out, put up deposit, and they have baby showers or weddings or whatever. And we have community events there and then they hang out at the pool and there's usually bathrooms to service the pool and, you know, so it's a whole sense of community for people to come and meet and greet and hang out. 
that's a really that's a really nice thing i hadn't even uh, considered with these sort of things because like you know in the house i'm in now it's quite nice and it, it's fine but i live with two of my friends but we have this sort of communal area where everyone always hangs out and we always come together and things and obviously i've had a few friends who live in flats and they just don't have that they, they live in these blocks and it's just every millimeter is somewhere to live all the stairs and that's it and it, there's nothing else to it and i just think so many other places could really benefit from that a community that's room right. that's a very good idea is that almost like a essential for every place that you renovate okay. you know we try to have dog parks with pet stations where they can pick up the poop and all <laughs> that stuff and then they all can put their dogs in this pen and just hang out and communicate together and you know at least the dogs get out so just again all every sense that we can make where we're promoting togetherness rather than social isolation we feel that helps society as well that's amazing and did you um, earlier say that you have a dog i'm sorry it was a random little tangent but uh, do you have any animals or pets yes i have uh, i just lost um, a doodle a labradoodle a few months ago and we still have an another one uh he's 12 almost 13 oh, wow oh, i'm sorry to hear about uh the the former dog. yeah there's a as a shame i mean it's like people say we don't deserve dogs like they're so loving and caring and affectionate and we just outlive them and it's really not fair what we do to this planet and what we're doing and it's like they're the ones who die first it's just a tragedy yeah they're i wish we could all be like dogs appreciative happy we forget we forgive <laughs> and just want to have fun and please that's a that's an, a beautiful way and i'll um i think i'll start to wrap up here because we're, we're getting uh near the mark so it's, it's been great chatting with you uh okay. so far um i don't know if there's anything else you want to sort of um add just to tell uh the folks before we sort of hang up this yeah i just do the right thing be thankful be appreciative and try to think of the other i think that's the most important thing we can all make this world a better place and I want to thank you for coming on the show. And I think that, you know, the world definitely needs more people like you who are, you know, you've got the right business mindset. You've got the right I philanthropic. Well, I just give people that are more interesting than me a voice and be able to sort of speak. I just want people like you to. Well, that's important. Thank you very much. <laughs> Man, we can spread the word. <laughs> <laughs> well, exactly. I just want people like you who are inspirational to really get more people to say, look, there are other ways of doing things. You don't just have to either be a businessman or be uh, philanthropic. You can be a culmination. You can do whatever you want to do. If you want to help people and you want to build up society, you can do both of those things. And people hopefully been listening to this will hear that and be inspired by the sort of things that you have. And um, are there many uh, websites and things that people could check you out? I'll be sure to include links and things, but I don't know if there's anything that springs to mind. Yeah, um, it's strategicrh.com for Realty Holdings. So I'm Eddie Lauren at Strategic Realty Holdings is the company and we have Alliant Strategic, A-L-L-I-A-N-T strategic.com. And so uh, those are two places you can always communicate with me and uh, you know, with this worldwide web, it's kind of cool. We can all be a lot closer together. Whereas 20 years ago, you doing this in London, my God, we would never even think to be able to communicate so easily. I know, and it's it's a gift. It is absolutely fantastic. We utilize this uh, connectivity for the good. For the good. There's plenty of not so good from it. So yes, I agree. Exactly. <laughs> well, wonderful. Well, thank you so much for um, speaking to me and your busy schedule, Eddie. It's been an absolute pleasure. Okay. All the best. Thanks, Ed. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye. And that's the end of the podcast. Thanks as always for tuning in, guys. Uh, next week, I'll likely be releasing the episode with Heather Vickery of The Brave Files. I was tempted to release this one this week, but I kind of ran out of time towards the end of the day, so I thought this one was already kind of mostly done, so I thought I'd do this one first. Um, and then after Heather's one, I believe I'll be doing the two-parter with Beth Crane of We Fix Space Junk. And then we'll see from there, because I've got a couple more uh, chats lined up. Apart from that, really, guys, there's not much else to report. You know, as I always say towards the end of these shows, you know, I really appreciate people sharing the show because I don't think that this show, every episode is going to, you know, appeal to every individual. But I believe that our back catalogue is different enough and extensive enough to probably have at least one episode that someone you know likes. So, you know, if you are listening and you have listened all the way to the end of this episode, I do really appreciate it. If you're a new listener, check out some of the older episodes we've done. I've done other ones with CEOs of businesses. Um, I've done one 
on to people to do with science and things. I've done ones about photography, anxiety, Crohn's disease, urban streetwear, all kinds of different things. So, you know, just flick through the back catalogue, see what kind of takes your fancy. And if you enjoy it, subscribe maybe, you know, and share some of the episodes of these that with other people. Uh, and if you're a regular listener, then I love you even more because you know, regular listeners or what, keep this show going, or well, that and my desire just to talk to really interesting people, so that's kind of pushing it as well, but I'm starting to ramble, and it's getting a little bit late over here, so I'm going to love you and leave you. Thank you, as always, for each and every one of you of listening, and I'll talk to all of you next week. <laughs>